Greetings students and welcome to yet another in a series of video lectures uh, for your gentleness practice class number seven. So today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about evaluation, termination, and follow-up. Um, so as always, I encourage you to watch the videos before you actually come to class, do your readings, and be prepared to engage in a lively conversation. So without any further ado, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So evaluation, and as you have probably recognized or realized by now that evaluation is one of the latter processes in the generalist intervention methodology. Um, and evaluation is a tool that we utilize in social work to really help us understand and determine whether the actual effort or the work that we have done in terms of the work with our clients, with our agencies, uh, actually has made a difference or was it worth the, the challenges that it was actually presented. So this particular competency in and of itself correlates with core competency number nine. Um, and it's about really looking at how we do an evaluation with families, groups, organizations, as well as communities. So evaluation, again, is a very important part of the social work methodology in that we want to make sure that the things that we are actually doing that's a part of that planned social change process is something that actually results uh, in the change that we're looking for um, and for us to be able to determine whether it's something that will have some value in the future. So such things to keep in mind. Um, again, so uh, just another uh, way to look at this whole piece around evaluation and Kirsten Hull talks about uh, this process that really looks at whether the change effort was worthwhile. So if we go through a process with a client to resolve a particular issue and we do the assessment and we look at all of the different factors that uh, impact whether that is actually happening or not, then we have to look at it in hindsight to really understand whether uh, it was in the client's best interest. Was it something they could do? Could they access it easily? Are there things that we could have changed or done differently? Did the process even work at all? Uh, so again, to making sure that as we build our repertoire as social workers to make sure that we have tools and processes and methodologies in our toolbox that actually work and that have been tried and tested over time. So evaluation really lends itself uh, to that particular process as well. Um, and then we do the evaluation across all of these particular domains. So as you know, we work in social workers in the micro practice systems. We also work in meso and we also work in macro. And so wanting to make sure that we understand that evaluation in all of these particular areas is absolutely essential and are pretty similar as we kind of go through the process. So again, when we start to think about that particular process, how do we evaluate? So it really determines how well we actually do our assessing and our planning and our implementation. So we really need to kind of go back through to look at whether the assessment was done properly, whether the planning for how we're gonna lay out the interventions work, and then the actual implementation in terms of that. And then we've also got a couple of different types of uh, evaluations and there's this formative process. And so when we talk about formative, it's about uh, assessing the adequacy and the efforts towards solving the problem and gathering the data. So for example, you are in this generalist class and so you have an assignment um, that, you know, that you're looking at having to complete. So I'll give you the instructions, I'll give you the information, you do your readings, you watch your videos like this, um, and then we have some conversation about um, how well you're understanding that. At some point, we'll have an assignment that will actually be a form of a formative evaluation, which will actually look at how well you understand and comprehend the material, and are you able to actually uh, implement those particular processes on your own. So in other words, if I were to give you a scenario that involved uh, one of the things that we had talked about in class, are you able to then demonstrate uh, sufficient knowledge of that particular process in class. So a formative evaluation works in that particular way. Now, a summative evaluation happens at the end. So if we look at the root word summative, that means, you know, the summary. Uh, so we're looking at what happens in terms of whether the change occurred uh, at the end of the particular process. So for example, um, you have competency assignments that are linked to all of your, pretty much all of your core courses. And so they're one of nine. And so the competency assignment is a way for I as an instructor and you as a student to demonstrate that you have 
sufficient knowledge and information about how the actual competency that you are uh, have to learn is actually implemented. So do you understand what we're talking about when we talk about systems integration and we talk about systems theory? So you'll have an assignment that you'll actually have to write, do some research and actually demonstrate that you actually do understand that particular line of methodology. So summative is looking at things towards the end and formative is actually as you're moving through the particular process. So just keep those things in mind as well too. So now, some other concepts that we need to really think about when we think about evaluations is we need to think about things like baseline, validity, and reliability. And so when we think about baseline, we're thinking about, you know, as we enter into a situation, a work situation with a client, you know, there typically is a problem that causes us to be involved in that particular family unit, right? So what we need to do in our assessment is we need to get a sense of how bad is it, how frequently does it happen, how disruptive is it for us in terms of that particular process? So, for example, here I've got um, you know frequent hand washing and OCD. So, if we've got a client who has obsessive compulsive disorder, and one of the symptoms is that they, they, they wash their hands, then at the beginning of the onset, I'm going to probably spend some time trying to figure out how often do they wash their hands, because that becomes the measuring point. So, if I've got a person that's washing their hands 100 times a day and the goal is to try to reduce the frequency, then the baseline is that 100, and then I can start to look at the interventions that I utilize with this particular person to see whether they actually reduce that number to less than 100 per day. So when we think about baseline, think about the actual constant state of how things actually are. Another important concept in evaluation is that of validity. Uh, and that really refers to and the extent that an instrument or a tool measures what it is supposed to measure. So how do we know that what we've done actually is what we've actually measured? And so one of the things that you'll see quite frequently um, in terms of tools are tools that I use, like for example, a pretest and a post-test. So I might give a client um, a, a pretest to just get a sense of what their level of understanding or type of information they may have about a certain thing then the intervention is me actually teaching them or giving them those particular uh, pieces of information so that they can understand that process. And then I'll do a post-test. And hopefully the post-test, which will resemble the pre-test, students or folks who have experienced that particular uh, intervention will be able to actually answer the post-test because they have now learned that particular information. So. The, the issue is, again, is really looking at measuring what it's supposed to be measuring. So if I wanna know whether, uh, if I teach skills X, Y, and Z, I teach those skills X, Y, and Z, I give a pretest beforehand to see what the knowledge base is uh, before we actually do the intervention. And then afterwards, the post-test should actually look different because it should actually have more information. And that's what we look at, or that's what we're talking about when we're talking about validity. The other piece is reliability. And so reliability is just as it says. And so can we take, for example, that pretest post test piece and continue to implement it in the same way with maybe different situations or different persons or different clients? And will we be able to get the same type of measurement each and every time? So those are important concepts when you're thinking about evaluation. Uh, because we need to know we have a starting point. We need to make sure we're measuring what we're measuring and we need to make sure that we can consistently measure those same types of things. So um, we need to also look at some of the other components of evaluation. We're thinking about things like uh, data gathering methods. So how do you get information from people? Sometimes you can set up observational measures. So I can actually set up a time to maybe go to a classroom um, and sit behind a partition and watch a child that might be having some difficulty in class uh, over a period of time to kind of see what their behavior actually is. So it helps me establish a baseline, but it also helps me gather information about what we're doing. So that's just an example. Self-reports are another one that we utilize quite a bit in social work practice in terms of, you know, the best source oftentimes of the information that we need about how things are going are actually the people themselves. So if I can get you to accurately fill out a self-report about certain types of behaviors, then that helps me understand in terms of gathering that particular information. Uh, you have the independent and dependent variables, and these are factors that are responsible for behavior and the outcome and the end product. So, you know, 
if I am looking at, let's go back to the OCD uh, piece again. So, you know, the independent variable might be that we've got this person that's washing their hands and um, the independent or the dependent variable that might be the intervention that I utilize that helps them change that particular behavior in terms of the process. So really understanding the difference in that. And as you are in social work research methods in the summer, they will dig much deeper into these particular concepts uh, that we are talking about here in terms of the evaluation pieces as well. Wanting to make sure that um, the information or the set of results can be generalized to another. So if this works with a group of fourth graders, is it possible that if we did some other work, would it work with a group of fifth graders? So if the things are all the same and um, basically we're looking at changing behaviors across these particular two classes, then we should be able to do some generalizable uh, information as it relates to whether things actually work. Now, uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on these because we'll spend some time um, looking at them in one of your classroom exercises, but we're also looking at the different types of design. So you've got your single subject design, you've got your goal attaining scaling, your task achievement scaling, class satisfaction survey, as well as target problem scaling. And so you can see the corresponding uh, pages in which you can find out a little bit more information about these particular items um, as it relates to the evaluation piece. Um, when we're thinking about program evaluation, you, we typically start with a needs assessment. So if I'm working in a community agency that provides um, mental health services to children. So I need to first of all do a needs assessment. What are the needs of the actual program? What are the goals that they're trying to accomplish as it relates to mental health services? Uh, and then I also need to look at the, evalu uh, the evaluability assessment. So if I'm providing a service, can I do it in such a way that I can actually measure whether that is actually happening or not? Uh, and so we, these are things that we're gonna do before we do the intervention. So before we maybe bring in additional monies for grant funding to actually do this particular project. We need to look at what the needs are for our clients that we serve and can we actually uh, evaluate what we're trying to do. Then there's also a process, um, the process analysis, the continuous quality assurance and program monitoring. Uh, and these are things that are doing or happening during the intervention. So it's another phase of the program evaluation. And so I have um, in parentheses the Hennepin County CFSR. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. So a lot, a lot of years ago, um, as a manager in the child welfare system, I was selected to be a part of a federal team that actually was looking at doing child family and service reviews for various counties. Their job was to really look at going through all 50 states to really look at how well we were actually implementing child welfare services. And so we started in Minnesota uh, with Hennepin County. And so I was a part of a team paired with a federal investigator. And we actually looked at, there were probably, I don't know, 20 or 30 of us in the team. And we actually were there in Hennepin County for like five days, 40 hours for that entire week. And we did a very thorough case analysis on eight cases, eight cases in a, in a county system that has thousands of cases. And we went extensively through these particular cases, doing interviews, uh, doing um, conversations with clients, with judges, with everyone who touched a case. We had a rating instrument that was probably about a half an inch thick that we had to fill out on every particular case that we actually interviewed. And so it was one of those types of process evaluations that you really can't prepare for. It's like, it's gonna happen and we're gonna find the results that we find. Uh, and unfortunately uh, for Hennepin, uh, all eight of the cases failed. So that was a sign uh, for that particular county in terms of the way that they were administering child welfare services did not meet the federal standards. And so they had to put a plan in place to really look at how we're gonna get your level of um, service up to where it needs to be as it relates to a federal funding and federal expectations. So that's just an example of what a process analysis and a continuous quality assurance program monitoring looks like as you're moving through that particular process. Um, and then finally, you also have, you have program outcome 
you still have continuous quality assurance and monitoring that also happens after the intervention. So we're actually, again, looking at, you know, from a program uh, outcome standpoint, were we able to actually achieve the goals that we had set forth based on the needs and our needs assessment in terms of what we're going to actually be supplying? Are we still following through and continually maintaining and fine tuning our quality assurance uh, in terms of making sure that we're always adjusting to make sure that we're getting the results that we actually need after the intervention happens? So thinking about the program evaluation uh, in a little bit different sense in that it's a lot larger and it's a lot uh, more intense and involved in terms of looking at systems and how they actually work and how they work together and whether they meet the accomplishments of the agency as we move forward. Very, very important as it relates to evaluation. Uh, and it's this whole notion of cultural competence in evaluation. So basically, you've got these particular three things that we need to be aware of. Um, often, and in uh, many cases, that whole notion of diversity, ethnic diversity and cultural awareness are not factored into the research. So if we take a research tool that we're actually looking at to either do um, an evaluation of an individual in a family and or a program that we're taking a look at, then we need to understand that we're, if we're, when we start to apply these same concepts to across different cultures, that we may have some different results. So in other words, the research will more than likely be biased because if it was not built and designed to really take into consideration cultural awareness, then the information that we may get from using these tools and some of those cultural diverse situations may be bad research and bad assumptions. So we're making sure that we have to look at that particular aspect. Also, you know, there's some things that we can do as, as well as when we're looking at these programs as well as micro level uh, evaluations is to make sure that there's research that deflects the characteristics of the entire population. So we need to have a tool that's going to work for everybody uh, and not just certain segments of our society. Um, we also need to look at how we gather the data, uh, given again that different cultures and different types of language barriers exist. Um, and there's a different way in which we need to oftentimes enter into minority or oppressed and marginalized communities that are outside of the mainstream norm. If we think about a lot of the research that is done um, in social welfare and in most research in general, it really caters itself to largely Caucasian audiences. And so if we are not cognizant and aware of that particular dynamic, then again, it could lead us to getting some bad data, some bad research, uh, to misinterpreting um, and gathering data in a poor way that really just kind of sabotages the rest of the process. So again, recognizing that there's language barriers, recognizing that we need to look at things from a gender neutral standpoint when at all possible, um, and then also to look at how we design tools that actually account for those ethnic differences. So those are things that are gonna be very important for you uh, as we think about how we move forward with evaluation. As we move into the final phases of the generalist intervention model, then we're really looking at things like termination. So all things start, all things come to an end. And as you recall, that the generalist intervention model is a planned social change methodology. So that it has a start point, uh, with the engagement, we work through uh, the assessment, we work through the planning, the intervention, and then we have to get to the evaluation and then the termination. So the ending of that particular relationship. Uh, so it happens in a couple of ways. Sometimes it's scheduled. You know, if I've got six months to provide services for you and your family around this particular issue, that at six months, then we need to be wrapping up that relationship. Uh, but there are also instances in sometimes beyond our control in which you know that particular relationship is interrupted unexpectedly you know people move or things happen or folks get reassigned or grants end those kind of things so we also need to know that this termination needs to be based on clear evidence that the goals and objectives are either being met or they're not able to be met or they're not feasibly attained so when we look at termination we need to do that so steps we need to decide when uh, we need to evaluate uh, the achievement of the objectives, you know, how well did people do, you know, 
in this particular particular area. So nine out of 10 times, how many times were they able to actually do the correct thing? Um, the evaluation methods are sometimes provided by the agency. Um, they are used for maintaining and uh, continuing progress as well. And then also you need to be aware of the fact that as a clinician, as a social worker, that you, as well as your client, may have an emotional reaction to the end of this relationship. After all, you've gotten to know these folks, these families, over a period of time, and there's a bond that actually sometimes develops uh, as it relates to that uh, uh, therapeutic, healthy relationship. And sometimes, as we know, when we have to end a relationship, those things can be difficult, uh, as well as the need to make appropriate referrals. So we've done as much as we are able to do in terms of our work with families, but we need to make sure that they continue to continue to get services if there's a need, and we look at setting up those pieces as well. So again, you know, we have the plan terminations, time limited. I would say that Typically, what I would do is when I'm working with a client, if I know this is a timeline piece, so day one is we're starting to look at the engagement and assessment, I'm letting them know that I'll only be working with them until X date. So, and we'll have that conversation potentially continuously uh, as we're moving through the process, as we're getting closer to the end date, and we're having probably more conversations about how that particular process works. So again, doing that, being able to summarize progress, being able to stabilize change, even being able to share yourself um, the self-disclosure around your feelings about having to bring this relationship to a close. Uh, for me, in my work, I always struggled with termination because I had gotten to a point where I liked my clients. I saw the worth and value that they had. I saw them making progress. And I want to continue to see those good things. But I know that uh, as a responsible social worker and clinician that I have to allow people to kind of walk out there and make it on their own. And so I have to resolve my own feelings about how I feel about closing that whole particular process. And so we need to also be mindful and help our clients do the same thing. Uh, and then we have the unplanned termination. So sometimes it just doesn't work. Sometimes we have chose the wrong intervention. Sometimes, you know, we're going down this road and the client is on board about what we need to do to try to resolve the issue and it still doesn't work. Um, or sometimes the client just drops out unexpectedly. I've had a number of clients over the years who were doing very well in the program, uh, doing what they need to do. And as we were coming towards the end, uh, they panicked, they got scared and they would disappear uh, or they would just stop being compliant or those particular things would start to happen. So um, we need to understand that sometimes clients will uh, have the ability to just to kind of terminate at their own. You know, client right to self-determination is still prevalent as well too. So think about that. So some reasons for those unplanned terminations. Uh, follow up. Uh, typically, it's around focusing on how the client is done after we have finished our service delivery. So that might be the form come in the form of a survey later on, I might do a phone call, follow up phone call just to check in to see whether things are still on track and working the way that they need to. Um, different agencies have different expectations as it relates to client follow-up. Um, some client, some agencies don't have any requirement for client follow-up, but I would contend that in most instances that even if your agency doesn't have a follow-up piece, that you as a professional in terms of your responsibility to your client, that you do one on your own. Um, you can use letters, phone calls, uh, surveys, oftentimes just kind of recognizing that that follow-up contact could be just kind of a booster shot to remind people that they do have the skill sets, they have made some of the necessary changes that they need to, and they can continue to be successful in their endeavors as well. So just making sure that we understand that whole piece. And so this brings to a close uh, my portion of the video lecture. And so I wanted to, um, again, just take this time to share with you all uh, this particular process around evaluation. It's very, very important. And so I just want you to get it uh, into your mind that it's a regular part of what we need to do as we have interventions with clients. So I thank you for your time and I will see you all in class. Take care.